tuli jälleen. Ciao Isotta. Grazie per l'invito. Thank you very much for the invitation. Di niente. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Um, well, good morning from my end. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, Italy. <laughs> um, uh, it's a, a real pleasure for me to welcome you all. Thank you so much for attending. Um, as you know, this is a series of lectures and talks and interventions um, that uh, focus on art and culture in the GDR. And today it's my great pleasure to welcome Isotta Poggi. However, before I do that, um, I would like to hand it over to Matteo Bertelet, who is a professor at uh, the Carfoscari University in Venice and my co-organizer for this series. And um, we kind of split the task um, of moderating um, these events. And so today it would be Matteo's task to introduce Isotta, but thank you so much for being here and we look forward to this event. Matteo, please take it over. Yes, <clears throat> and good evening, yeah, everybody. It's really a pleasure for me tonight to introduce you to Isotta Poggi, who is with us. And Isotta is curator of photographs at the Getty Research Institute in Los Angeles. And she works as a photography curator at the, at the same institute. Uh, with the collections documenting cultural heritage history. Her research interests include the cultural history of photography during the Cold War across the Iron Curtain, particularly in the Eastern Bloc countries. So that uh, five years ago in 2018, she co-curated an exhibition on Cold War Hungary at a Vende Museum in Culver City, so in the greater Los Angeles area and co-edited the accompanying catalog Promote, Tolerate, Tolerate, Ban, Art and Culture in Cold War Hungary. Her current research project is called On the Eve of the Revolution, the East German Artists in the 80s. And it draws on the GRI, the Getty archives, and the collections on the GDR, including over 150 artist books and magazines produced by East German independent presses. Uh, printed in the last decade of the regime in the 80s, which is also the focus of, of today's talk. I um, had a chance to have an insight already into Isotta's Isoka, slides and presentations. I'm really thrilled to, to be able to, yeah, to see it again and to share it with you. So I'm really giving the floor to you, to Isotta. You can start also yeah, sharing your presentation. And yes, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Matteo and Sven, for the kind introductions and for giving me the opportunity to discuss uh, our current uh, research on uh, East German Samis art and photography. Um, that is, uh, as you already mentioned, very much based on the collections of the Getty Research Institute. Can everybody hear me well? Yes? Okay. So I'm going to share my screen. And um, now you can see my screen, I hope. And uh, uh, I am going to uh, introduce the topic uh, by explaining that uh, this uh, focus research on photography and this German samizdat is within a larger umbrella research project called On the Eve of Revolution, the East German Artist in the 1980s which is very much based on the collections of the Getty Research Institute. First, I want to clarify that the Getty Research Institute is a sister organization of the Getty Museum and has nothing to do with Getty images. I just want to put it out there because they are very different kind of uh, operations. The Getty Research Institute is an institute for advanced studies in the visual arts. And in the early 1990s, so right after uh, at the time of the Vende acquired a large collection of archives and documents. And we have about 50 linear meters of archival material in the Getty Research Institute about the GDR. 
archives from uh, scholars, artists, and galleries of all kinds of materials. And including with this collection, there is also the collection of East German Samizdat, self-published books. I'm sure many of you already know the term from the Russian self-published, which means uh, kind of the literature that was produced in the Eastern Bloc countries and the Soviet Union during the Cold War to be independently circulating for, compared to the state publications. And uh, the GRI has more than 150 of these artist books and magazines. And uh, one of the focus that we have in our research is the use of photography in this type of genre of uh, uh, Samizdat. That was a very much an intermediate uh, type of uh, literature, combining pre-making with prose and poetry and uh, uh, photography in its own terms. So our research project is co-led uh, with my colleague, Emily Pugh. You can find our webpage uh, by typing the keywords of the title of the project. You find it immediately with a lot of the links uh, to the collections that I just described. The image that we chose to illustrate the project, you see it here cropped, is with a big title, USW. This is a, a photograph in the collection. USW is the German word abbreviation for Umso Weiter, which means and so on. And it was a title of one of such publications and uh, that we have here also at the Getty. This diagram or mind map that you see photographed uh, was created by three very important East German artists, Misha Brendel, Esther Gabriel and uh, Rainer Gors, who were young students just out of art school in Dresden in the mid 80s, when they wanted to produce, uh, to propose and conceive a new publication for artists by artists. And here was a big title placed on the top. Then they designed the one, two, three steps that you can see. They added some symbols that you can see here. This is a purse. The purse was added by Elsie Gabriel to represent travel and movement and mobility. And then another photograph here from an illustrated magazine of three women running in the water towards horizon line, escaping from reality. Also a metaphor for, for a certain kind of state of mind. What is very important here is that the beginning you can uh, see, I hope you can see in the screen uh, the details. Um, here, there are four elements that are the core structure of these magazines. It's the word concept, photography, graphic, and lyric and prose. And this is because these artists really were advocating for a highly intermediate dialogue between artists from all different kinds of disciplines and styles. So the sum is that in its own um, core in East German art that is extremely diversified in media and in styles. You see how they represented here the little squares with the works that are being submitted. And then the process of looking at uh, what these materials are and can tell us and then uh, the layout that can be done as a leporello or as a grid uh, fold outs and so on. So this image is very rich because the photograph itself is actually scaling down a human sized drawing that the artist had made on the on paper hanging on walls. So you see how the photograph is already extrapolating the concept of the magazine and uh, making it accessible by circulating it. The very back of the photograph shows these two other images. On the left is the drawing that we had just seen being erased, wiped out. The artist, after doing all the picture, after taking a picture, a photograph of it, they started to wipe it out. That is erasure, this process of acting on the image and making it disappear. You can uh, realize hopefully that this is the floor uh, where they were standing when they were acting on this image. This is a paint of color. This is a uh, paper 
uh, being ripped from the wall. After they did this, they actually destroyed the entire physical image and spin it around in this very performative kind of uh, action that you see uh, only the image is has survived. You can still barely see the title. So this image was very important because is uh, showing the kind of uh, books that, that we are dealing here that we have in the collections that are incredibly vibrant because they are rich in original graphics. And the additional layer uh, that I mentioned already about the dissemination and the circulation of these materials and information through the sun is that you can see it here. The actual photograph you just saw is a fold out. This is the fold and is stapled inside this magazine. This is the spine of the magazine. So basically the artist from Dresden had made a print, acted on it and then sent it to the editorial board of the magazine called Shaden that is in our collection. All these Eastern Masamis that uh, uh, tends to be the magazines um, are very collaborative. They have usually a table of content that you see on the front where you have a, a little bit of an understanding of what is inside, usually organized by media. And uh, in the, the detail at the very bottom that I enlarged here, it says post, and uh, he's listing the materials that were mailed uh, to the editorial team of the magazine. And uh, our photograph is simply captioned with the three letters, USW and Dresden. So it's very laconic and minimalist way of expressing all the concept behind that image that we see in Shaden. Um, I'm showing here the cover of the magazine that, that, uh, where the image was uh, shown so that you have a, a visual uh, sense of the raw material and graphics that were used. This is uh, Schade and the word damage in uh, German uh, had to do with the fact that these materials, once they were received by the uh, editors, would be stapled together put it in an envelope, then the envelope would be, uh, actually, I should have said, they are put it in an envelope and then they are stapled together. And you may be able to see the staples here. And then uh, when, uh, and then they would seal the envelope. So when uh, the readers are receiving their magazine, they actually have to damage, act on this magazine to open it and experience it. Um, the, the magazine Shaden is uh, 17 issues and the, uh, the photography starts to be used a little bit more and more to, in the second half of the run after what we had the issue that we just saw. And here it even made it on the cover, which was quite uh, amazing and unique uh, respect, uh, respect to the other issues or other magazines. And um, this particular issue is interesting in many ways for, for the use of photography. Um, the front and the back cover are designed by Eberhard Goschel, an artist who was born in 1943 and unfortunately just died in December 29 of, of last year in 2022. And uh, which is really unfortunate because I would have been very happy to ask him more about these photographs because he was a pre-maker and a painter, not a photographer, but the fact that he's using this, uh, proposing these images is showing you the uh, level of experimentation that is, uh, um, up, that appears in this kind of uh, um, East German sun is that, it's very unique. Um, the, the front page, you see the house with the reflections that are abstracted and in the back, a sculpture uh, where he's playing with the ambiguity of the orientation of the image that would have been taken as a landscape, but is presented as a portrait. What uh, this issue that we just uh, introduced uh, uh, contains a set of 12 photographs, uh, uh, vintage prints by Heike Stefan documenting 
a scene, uh, particularly an event that happened, a poetry reading that happened, uh, and it was announced through the Schaden magazine um, in the Samariter Kirche in Berlin. You know that uh, the churches played a very important role in, uh, in East Germany as uh, uh, venues for uh, where to congregate and talk uh, uh, freely or independently from the system. And uh, even the literature and poetry reading would have been uh, 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 welcome in this kinds of uh, setting. You may recognize here Sasha Anderson, who is photographed by Heike Stefan in this double exposure, very ambiguous. And then uh, in, in this photograph is Peter Botti, who had uh, actually organized this event called uh, Wort um Werk. And uh, I'm pointing out here just Gerd Neumann here because we will see him later. But I want to point out in general about the fact that, that here we have a photographer who wants to be involved in the art scene. And the way she's doing it is by capturing the moments and the personalities and the individual characters with the camera. It was her way of being involved in this kind of uh, moment and artistic scene. She also, Heike Stefan, made these incredibly beautiful photographs of a performance that she conceived with title Zaide 83, Silk 1983. Um, that is incredibly evocative. Also, these prints are in the Schaden issue, the same one that uh, uh, we are discussing. The, in, here you have something a little bit ambiguous at first. You don't know what's happening, but you feel like you want to be brought in into this piece of work. But when you look in detail, you can see that this is actually a figure, a human figure, the two legs, the hand, the arm, and the head. And this person, he's standing on top of a, of a hill called Gagenhugel in near Erfurt. And the big fabric that uh, is around the body of this figure, of this friend of Heike Stefan, is blowing in the wind. You have to imagine a giant piece of silk, so it's very fragile and delicate, but also standing the shape of the wind. And so you have incredibly visual metaphor for what she wanted to do here. And uh, this is another photograph from a different perspective where you can start to read uh, the uh, reference to the Dike of Samotracha, Samotrace, uh, the symbol of victory, but also the flight of Icarus. And you know that the uh, East German uh, artists were very much interested in the archetypal uh, meaning of the ancient Greek mythology. So you have many different ways you can read this. Again, you can see the, the friend, these are the legs, these are the arms joining and the front, and then the head here and these incredible wings as to take off. In fact, the performance was shut down by the authorities because uh, a balloon escape had just happened from East Germany to West Germany, and the police thought that somebody was trying to take off. But another important element of this story is that uh, the silk in itself, the materiality of the silk, for Heike Stefan represented a, a a, a desire to do something with the last piece of silk that she could find in the store, addressing the issue of shortage of goods. She knew when she bought this piece of silk that she could not be sure when it will be the next time that she can find material like that. And there was a, a reason to glorify this actual piece of fabric, which is an important aspect for East German art and photography. She also made this incredibly beautiful montage work that is in another issue of Schaden, um, where she has a, she's a feminist artist, textile artist, uh, working in mixed media with photography, as we already saw. And uh, here she made a montage collage, highly intermedia, like very common in, for East German artists. And here I am breaking down the piece on the left that is one single work of art in the three components that are sandwiched together. 
So you can understand the top side, you see a silhouette made like a line drawing, but except that uh, instead of being done with a marker or a pen, it's made with a sewing machine. So you imagine the skillfulness of these artists to work with a sewing machine as a drafting tool and create this very expressionistic uh, figure of a dancer. These are the two feet. This is the head and the hands are here and the breast is here and uh, try to escape from uh, the page, from the space of the page. The, here, when you look at the original, the, the line on the left is the actual stitching that she did uh, to seal together the three dimension. Here, the second part is a photograph on transparency of an artist who is actually carrying on a performance wrapped in plastic. So this plastic, the suffocating, you saw it before with the silk, has to do with the element of want of searching freedom of movement. And then on the third uh, layer is a handwriting by Heike Stefan, who is making commentary about poetry that she had been hearing from uh, by Sasha Anderson. So you see how this dialogue of image and the sound elements is brought in uh, through this particular piece. Heike Stefan was also one of the few artists uh, who became involved uh, in a conceptual photography set portfolio um, with own a title, is the official title, but it is about conceptual photography. It was brought together by Cornelia Jentsch who uh, was a curator and editor of photography publications and exhibitions. And uh, she um, collected the work of uh, seven artists, including Ida Stefan. You can see here her images, physically applied uh, as frames of a movie from contact sheets or from film, and then uh, uh, acted on the, on the actual cover of the magazine. We don't have time to talk about all of them. So I'm going to just highlight the work of Misha Brandel, who is the one who did the USW photograph at the very beginning, where he is performing in this print. These are large prints, like uh, uh, 40 by uh, about 45 centimeters on the uh, long side. And uh, he is running a performance where he is under an air mattress. You see here the little air outlet and the images are pasted on it. So it's about this overwhelming bombardment of images that uh, it's being uh, produced and uh, pressing on the body. And then uh, uh, he's moving around. The performance has to do with uh, him uh, uh, crawling into a bath where the images will disappear. And um, like uh, in the USW uh, act that we saw earlier. But what is interesting here is how he's actually played with the materiality of the entire uh, frame. He's printed the entire frame of the film. You see all the holes here. And then he adds uh, text, uh, all many made up words to reflect on his own performance and adding also the uh, credits to the uh, sound track uh, by Tom DeRose with whom he ran the performance. And this is to bring in the sound element that is very important in this East German uh, Samizdat and photography and I'm going to show uh, some example like this one, Gesprochene Lieder, where the sound element is in the title. In, um, um, I also want to point out most of the books that we have are from the Jens Henkel collection, but some books uh, were not uh, in, that collect the, in that bibliography that he wrote about the genre. And this is one example. So it's extremely rare, unique book that we, uh, could find uh, about the feminist artist working in Erfurt uh, with Gabi Stolze. You know her because the first lecture of this series by Eske Rosenfeld was exactly about the, the collective as liberation of uh, Gabriele Stolze. 
And uh, she is uh, the author of this uh, book, which is a collection of prints and photo poems, where the artist, uh, Gabriele Stotzer, Heike Stefan, Cornelia Schleimer, and Marianne Clement are uh, doing performance uh, to make a commentary about uh, gender roles in society and the uh, female roles uh, uh, in, in uh, uh, men relations. And so here I'm just showing one, an example to see how important is the, the, the use of dialogue and poetry in relation to photography with this uh, um, kind of very musical, uh, if you will, uh, series of verses that mimic a parallel to the floor and the woman is cutting across with her body. So it's a very highly visual kind of material that is, was created to balance uh, the visual and the textual in this instrument, some is that. Another book that uh, Gabriele made uh, is uh, Die Blinden dirigieren das Chaos. Very important uh, because the metaphor of who is ruling chaos, the blind, for uh, Gabriele Stotzer that represents the wise, the outcast, the ones that are not in the system. Uh, and she's referring to the ancient Greek uh, 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 anecdotal story of Theresia, Theresia, who was blind but could see the future better than anybody else. And that's where she's using the title. Uh, she's making these contact sheets, kind of small framed images where you have this kind of filmic uh, sequencing presentation of a woman all wrapped her head, she cannot see, she can move her arms, and here also the arms are very important to give directions, but she cannot move because uh, the legs are tied. In uh, these names are the protagonists of this book that uh, Gabi Stotze was working with, and um, uh, it's a giant book. It's half a meter high, the, the height, it's a leporello. The back of the leporello shows these watercolor drawings that she made of free flow of consciousness type of writing, a little bit Dadaesque, very spontaneous, and sketches that she was making. But this was her way to act in public spaces where she could actually meet people. And the people that she could meet were outcast, like I was mentioning earlier. The, the punk scene, the younger, rebellious, anarchist, punk who does not want to work. You know that that is very political in East Germany because it's illegal to not be working. And uh, uh, I'm just singling out uh, the characters of Rambo, Ralph, in this role, and Spine in this first top row because there are two characters that she, in particular she she talked about to me, many of these artists gave me and our team an oral history. And uh, these are, uh, Rambo was one uh, who did not want to work and he ended up in prison for asocialität. And here he's shown like challenging the system and walking away. And Spine also was not able to finish his art school degree because when he showed up for the final exam, he had a punk hairdo and uh, they didn't let him get his degree. So this was a, a, a very important documentation of the, what it is like at East German art uh, in the 1980s in, uh, uh, through these different channels. In this case, we also see another punk being portrayed, but in a very different setting. Uh, this is a portrait of Stefan, 17 year old. The artist is Christiane Eisler. She took a photograph, a portrait of him in 1983. It's very important because Christiane Eisler comes from the Leipzig Hochschule uh, for photographing a book Kunst. So she's a very well trained photographer. You see the contrast in approach and presentation of something like this the punks here and the punks here. And, uh, uh, of course, in this case, this is a very different circulation mode. The duo, the diptych that you see here uh, on the left is the portrait of Stefan in 83. 
but on the right is a memorial uh, in his memory because he had just died from suicide, jumping from the monument that you, man, many of you already know, the Volkerschlag uh, uh, in Leipzig, which was a very important, still now, a very important monument to represent the German identity as victory. He had been erected in the beginning of the 20th century. However, he memorialized the defeat of Napoleon 100 years earlier in the 19th century, and uh, it was still being used to, to create uh, the identity, to build the identity of a big Germany, a victorious Germany. So to choose that as a site for suicide is very highly symbolic in, uh, in this moment. And uh, also notice how the presentation of these two images is uh, compared to uh, Gabriele Sturzer in the previous book. But this is because we are now entering the presentation of a, a portfolio called uh, uh, Photo Anschlag that was produced in Leipzig. And uh, it brought together uh, under the leadership of uh, and the vision of Karim Saab, um, 32 photographers, most of them professional photographers, who also who use photography as an artistic expression. And uh, it's a very important, interesting uh, um, document to study is German photography in, uh, at the time because it's very highly personalized. The title itself, Photo Anschlag, uh, has a political meaning. It's about the impact of photography, what it is doing. And so every single case you will see some kind of a narrative and uh, 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 pushing uh, an agenda, pushing uh, through the image and uh, the photograph, also because of the text. Every artist is 32 artists. There is a presentation, a text that is usually written by professional writers like Christoph Tanner or, or Gabriele Muster. But uh, in some cases, the artists themselves are uh, self uh, representing uh, not only with through the photography, but also uh, through writing. And in this case, I'm showing uh, Werner Liebernecht because uh, he's very interesting and is engaging his work with the camera to try to capture what the human eye cannot capture and create a new different reality. And uh, uh, I'm showing how the sum is that the intermediate dialogue that uh, uh, I mentioned earlier of Werner Liebernecht is very clear in this uh, spread in another magazine called Unzo Fork. After USW, there was a new magazine called And So Forward, and uh, where there is a collaboration of Olaf Stoy, a poet, a printmaker who made this beautiful poetry, kind of Dadaist poetry together with an helicopter hovering over you, the sub theme of this issue was Flugversuch, flight attempt. And so you can see how poetry, pre-making and photography, in this case, a, an action where an artist, Liebernet, is trying to capture the ability of a human being to take off with its own arms. That's why the arms are moving so fast. Imagine a hummingbird. And here he's trying to do that. And of course, he cannot do it. Only the camera is capturing the, the mental state. And then ne the next page, in fact, uh, you see the, uh, what happens uh, uh, after trying to take off. You are basically falling down. There is an umbrella here. If you can see the little detail, it is kind of ro rocambolesque uh, falling down, uh, the downfall, with title Sturz, which is fall, downfall. And uh, in parallel, in dialogue, complemented this Greifvogel, predatory bird kind of uh, experience of flying. So you see how rich this dialogue of the images is. I am going to show the more documentary photography of uh, Karin Vickhorst here, another artist in uh, Photo Anschlag, where you see two images that look very straightforward but they are politically important because the one on the top is the, the Bahnhof Friedrichstrasse, which was the cross-border 
between East and West Berlin. The image was not easy to take. The people could not go there with the camera and just take a picture. They had to do it without being seen. And Karin uh, uh, also lost a lot of her footage because it was confiscated by police who did not let her uh, circulate images that she was taking. But she was able to take this one, which is a very important image to show the dynamics of people in this very uh, particular place of, cross, uh, uh, of crossing, where there is one line here of the people going towards, the, towards West Berlin and the people in the middle waiting for their friends from West Berlin. And these are people, the next line going to East Berlin. And then somebody passed by, somebody looking here in the middle. It's a very rich uh, image to look at. And then of course, the Brandenburg Gate seen from the West. And we are in 87. So it's still a time we know that by 87, there is a, a much more opening a reform happening but it's still not so taken for granted that an East German would go to Berlin, to West Berlin and take pictures and bring them back so easily. It was not an easy thing. But the documentary photography of Karin Dickers also was important for in another issue. These are two prints in Schaden, the magazine I discussed at the beginning, where there is a film screening of, screening of real film which was a film, an experimental film by Lutz Dambeck. And you probably, many of you know his name because he's a very successful artist to this day. And uh, who um, in the last years of being in East Germany, this is like one of the last things he did before he left. He was making a, a he screened a film that has to do with uh, um, the use of propaganda in cinema, commerce and uh, reality. And these are two prints. You can see the audience in the foreground um, and uh, Lutz Dambeck looking at the film in itself, another type of performance um, that uh, Karin Dickhurst uh, photographed. So these are prints that bring open up a whole new aspect of how photography was used. And uh, these are uh, the captions in the back, uh, that the handwriting by Karen Dickers to explain uh, what uh, the content of this uh, real film are. But uh, um, the portraits, uh, uh, Karen Dickers did also a major uh, series of uh, portraits of artists in East Germany. And this particular set of uh, portrait of Ang Angela Hampel, uh, belongs uh, to a series that she made uh, called the Begegnungen Encounters that was recently exhibited in Leipzig, uh, the whole series. But we have at the GRI this particular set, which I find wonderful because you see this uh, incredibly collaborative uh, energy behind uh, uh, photographers and visual artists working together. So in this series, after the photographer has made the uh, the picture, the artist is working on the picture to elaborate the, the sense of self-expression through the, her art in this case. So the yellow part that you see is lithography applied to the photograph and you see how it's encapsulating the image and uh, turning into a kind of an avatar, if we can say that today. And uh, this portfolio, uh, these two prints belong to a portfolio that was put together by Eigen Plus Art, a gallery, a highly experimental workshop exhibition space that started in Leipzig in the 80s by uh, Judy Liebke, who is still very active today as a gallerist uh, with galleries in various places in Berlin. And uh, I'm showing other exam examples of self-expression through photography and uh, uh, painting and uh, photography playing with light uh, expressions. These are the works uh, of uh, self-portraits of Klaus Elle, um, who is also very active to this day. And uh, I'm showing another example of a very personalized style. This is a, a portrait of Christoph Tannert, uh, one of the most important writers from East Germany um, about the East German art scene. And uh, it's a portrait of him and uh, a portrait of a hand holding a ball. 
ready to launch, ready to start something new. And uh, so this is uh, just to show you also the network that we are having in this uh, kind of um, uh, network of artists. Um, uh, then I want to show this uh, book, uh, the, bring the attention to uh, this title, the Stime the Spigens, this oxymoron of a title, The Voice of Silence. Uh, written by Gerd Neumann that I, I mentioned earlier uh, because of the poetry reading in the Samaritan Kirk. Uh, he was a, 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 an important uh, figure of the literature of the time who had been banned from writing and uh, he started to be involved in the Samizdat literature contributing to Anschlag, another magazine, and Ariadne Fabrique. In this case, uh, his text, uh, the Stimme des Feigens, is illustrated and complemented by photographic uh, frames put together by uh, Dietrich Oltmanns, another artist who is using uh, photography in a very conceptual way to capture the everyday with this kind of chance approach to street photography, sometimes with people, sometimes facades, sometimes signs and details of the city. A, a very important kind of uh, uh, work that he, he has done. And, uh, and then we go back to a more documentary kind of work, but with a very new type of contents. We are here at the end uh, in, uh, of the 80s. In, 18, uh, in 1989, in October in Leipzig, the peaceful revolution and the demonstration. This is a photograph by Gerhard Gabler, uh, is documenting the unthinkable until a year earlier, or maybe even months earlier, that was just uh, starting to happen. This photograph uh, was, and, and the two images after, like these two, were uh, produced with the, um, the writing of Volker Brown in a portfolio called uh, the Erfahrung der Freiheit. So, what is really the new kind of photography is in the new times that uh, are coming or are happening is important because this is no longer an independent press magazine that is producing this portfolio, is the Pirkheimer Gesellschaft in Kulturbund der DDR. So it's a very kind of official organization who did amazing, marvelous printmaking projects that are also in the GRI collection. And, uh, but the, at the end, it's a very new story that is being shown here. So here we show how photography is used within photography. Uh, a mother presumably is holding the portrait of her daughter who is in prison, that's what the caption says. And then a propaganda uh, protest signs um, against the, the SAD. And uh, I want to go back to the GRI archive with this very small print, it's like a postcard size, but it's a gelatin silver print showing a line of candles melting and distorting and uh, having completely uh, transformed themselves in this uh, cluster of light and wax and wetness and darkness. This is a photograph uh, that was sent by uh, the Harald Kirchner, you may know his name, is an important photographer from East Germany, and his uh, wife, Jutta, to Ralf Rainer Wasse, a, a conceptual photographer from Karl Marx Stadt, who did a lot of work, he started his uh, artistic uh, creative career with the Clara Mosch group. And then of course, it was also revealed that he was somewhat responsible for the demise of the group because of his photographic uh, reporting. And uh, it's interesting that in this letter, uh, Harald Kirchner was sending regularly over the years a Happy New Year card to Ralf Reinevasse. And we have them in the collection here, but this is the one for 1990. And uh, a handwritten caption here reads Leipzig, 6 November 89 for their Stasi. So you see how the handwriting itself is enriching the photograph on the other side of a lot of layered meanings about the content of the photograph and the, the recipient and the sender, and of course the time. 
with uh, with this, I just want to briefly bring uh, uh, attention to this poem, the Deutsche Trauma Nein and Wintertag, because it's a beautiful photo poem that was written by Thomas Gunther and uh, with a photograph by Sabine Jan, his partner. They were also very much involved in the Samizdat. It's a photograph that is showing the interior of a courtyard of a prison, but now there is this sense of liberation through the poem. Uh, Thomas Gunther himself, uh, after uh, the vendor started to fly around and travel around to bring uh, archives to various collections, that's how Sam came to the Getty and went to Stanford and other places and to the Vendor Museum in, in, uh, in, uh, uh, here in Los Angeles that was mentioned earlier by Matteo, where you see how the poetry, this is poetry that was written before the Vendor, but now it's becoming, it's repurposed as a special edition print in a portfolio at the Vendor Museum of the Cold War. And I wanted to bring this back to the fact that, that all this research that we can do is because we do have access to these materials and we can trace the history and the intention of the artists who are still with us and can tell us their story. And with this, I want to thank you with this picture that it's also gelatin silver print from the Fluchversuch book that I showed earlier where there is a typewriter that looks like uh, actually producing images. You see this highly intermediate uh, approach of uh, uh, photography with text and printmaking. And I thank you and uh, I'm, I hope it was interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Zota. We do really thank you for your presentation, for bringing for showing us so much new material. I would like to open up immediately to the floor for questions, comments, anything. Okay, this is not the question. Um, anyone? Oh, Sven? Um, yeah, thank you so much, Isota. That was a wonderful uh, presentation, incredibly rich and and full of good ideas and and material. Um, so, I wanted to ask: um, to what extent are you aware of the the sort of technical context in which these magazines operated? Um, what do we know about how they were were produced, for example? Um, or what do we know about their circulation? Um, I'm also really interested in what your sense is, what function they had. I mean, one gets the impression that on some level they had a very basic communicative function to um, inform our artists in these uh, circles of each other's work. So there was a sort of an exhibition aspect to them um, that probably so there was a documentary function inherent in them that 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 is something we don't necessarily associate when we hear the word magazine or art magazine. We think tend to think of them as something quite different. So I think it would be important to see um, if we can, yeah, if we can, um, you know, find out what sort of a function they might have had, how they circulated, and so forth. Another thing that struck me throughout your presentation was the incredible sensitivity to language. Um, yes. The enormous um, sort of breadth and, you know, wealth of wordplay, um, particularly, I mean, you know, to call this magazine Schaden or Damage, and then force people who open this magazine to damage it uh, is absolutely fascinating. Um, and I wonder, you know, what is your take on this aesthetics of damage, um, which um, it was not the only example. Yeah, there were other instances where one was thinking of damage and destruction as creative principles behind some. <clears throat> of so I'm curious if you could um, maybe elaborate on that a little bit. Yes. Well, in terms of circulation, you have to realize that because it was GDR, because congregating was not an easy thing to do uh, or spontaneously, and this material did not circulate very openly. 
and uh, they would circulate, uh, for example, within the, the church setting, but it's not like they, they would have uh, exhibitions to launch them when a new issue is released for political reasons, for social reasons, because it was not even allowed. So in fact, from that point of view, uh, the material has not, is not really known because it could not circulate a lot. So for example, Shaden was 25 copies. How many people, you know, can be circulated? Of course, there are exceptions and Uwe Warnke told me how uh, his magazine that he founded in 1992 called the uh, Order about the uh, visual poetry, also heavily strong based on uh, uh, original graphics, which was a very important premises for this kind of uh, literature. He uh, found people who had read his magazine that beyond his own reach. So he was very happy, but that was not easy to do. Uh, even when Photo Anschlag was produced, and you would imagine that that was something in incredibly uh, satisfactory as an accomplishment, even something like that could not be exhibited or launched publicly. So it didn't circulate a lot. Um, but uh, for the practical reasons that we were saying. At the same time, within the universities, many of these artists came out, were, went to art academies. So that's how they met each other and were creating art together. There was that certain kind of freedom that was coming out of being at the university of art schools. So within that, there was a little bit of freedom, but everything that was happening had to deal with uh, the inability to openly uh, discuss uh, these kind of materials and literature. Thomas Kuntel, for example, uh, he, his books were confiscated by the Stasi. He made the various, uh, um, various artist books that would, they would just come and take them away and he would have to <clears> protest uh, that there was no legal grounds for that, but it was very difficult. Certainly. Thank, thank you. Um, Gabriele? Yes, thank you very much Isotta, for this very rich presentation and also fascinating. Uh, I also have a question about the background information which might help to contextualize um, this, this images, this photography. And uh, I would like to ask you, what about, uh, or how can you reconstruct the biographies? Do you have also resources, since you uh, um, presented the sources, the um, pictures of the Getty Research Institute, do you have also uh, sources at, in Los Angeles which help us to reconstruct the political biography of some of these uh, artists? Thank well. You. The, you know, what is interesting about the summits that of the 80s is that is for the most part, the idea uh, of the younger generation, the artists who were kind of coming of age in the 80s, so the ones born in the 50s and 60s, not exclusively, we saw Eberhard Goschel and uh, Lutz Stambeck were born earlier, but uh, so for many of them, uh, it's still possible to talk with them. And that's what we are doing. We are reaching out to, to all the ones that we are uh, uh, able to, to reach uh, over time. And so we have the, their personal oral history that we are collecting from them, which is extremely important because without that, it's impossible to understand what was happening, why they did what they did. Except uh, in some cases, uh, yes, we have archival material for Ralph Rainer Wasser in the collection and some other artists. But again, uh, the oral history is the most important element, I find, uh, uh, to uh, understand, uh, interpret, and uh, explain these materials. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Are there other questions? comments. Mm, I, I do have a question, actually. I was wondering, which also in a way connects to what Gabriele asks, asked, which has to do with yeah, oh, yeah. um, background. Since you mentioned that many of those authors, they do have a background in academy. For example, yes. in, the famous, 
in the famous book school for example in Leipzig so I was wondering whether uh, they were also officially recognized for example as photographer in a way photography I was wondering whether yes photography what was the status of photography also in the official sphere in, oh, the, in this period that, the very that's late a very period important question yeah, it is. yeah thank you Matteo because uh, I you know if I had had more time I would have explained that what the official photography was supposed to do to I have the contrast with the Samizdat, but I really want to instead show you more example of this incredibly dynamic and vibrant art scene. But the official photography had a very important role, uh, as you know, in socialist countries to document reality with a propaganda undertone of uh, highlighting the best of society and the worker, the working, working class and the workers as positive uh, figures and role models. So photography was tended to be a photography that has a social mission, mission of optimism, uh, happy workers, if you will, or motivational photography, uh, sports, you know, beautiful uh, scenes uh, like the family of men photography. Um, and these artists that we see for the most part uh, were trained in photography at the Leipzig school uh, because that was the only place where you could do it. But they were intellectually very uh, stimulated uh, in uh, this uh, uh, cross-disciplinary mode. And of course, to understand what was happening in, uh, abroad, in West Germany, in the Western world, in other socialist countries. So they had a very different kind of photography that uh, produced, that they produced through this material purposely. We have ways to look at uh, how photography was uh, at the beginning of the 80s uh, through the 1982 National Exhibition, the ninth edition, where photography was shown for the first time. And uh, it really helps us to see how it, what was considered the best photography in a national exhibition. We are able to look at, at you know, some are the same names that we see in the Samis that and uh, in the 1982 exhibition. So we, it's a very interesting to, to compare and see these developments. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So you mean the, the, the big uh, exhibition in Dresden, right? The yes, big yes. G GDR, okay, which was like yes. the main yeah, yes. um, showcase of, of national art. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, I see, yeah. And um, yes, Anna. Oh. Um, hello, and uh, hello. thank you so much for this wonderful talk. Um, I just have a question uh, about the context, um, actually, and, and uh, sort of a little bit of the, the West to East uh, um, uh, sort of comparison, uh, because I, I, I know that you, um, you're also very uh, well versed in all these um, movements that were sort of parallel to the, to the um, Sort of East German uh, unofficial scene in, in the West, and they were co well contemporaneous with it. So uh, 1980s performance art um, experimental photography. So I was just wondering what you uh, what you thought. To what extent you think that uh, the artists in the in the Samizdat scene were kind of keeping up with some of the trends from the West, um, or or uh, let's say sort of keep. keep keeping up with what was going on in the West and then to what extent they were sort of um, trying to maybe develop their own uh, movements, their own approaches, um, or um, in case they did cop, let's say copy or, or, or approximate uh, Western uh, contemporary developments in, 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 uh, um, in contemporary photography and art, to what extent the kind of East German context changes what they were doing and makes it uh, sort of their own. I hope that was not too... Uh... Yeah, yeah. Well, the, you know, Misha Brendel, um, I didn't show other photographs from the portfolio of conceptual photography, but in there, there is a performance that he's doing that is a tribute to Joseph Beuys. And that is a very important concept because, so someone like Joseph Beuys was totally known and understood in East Germany. The, you can now make a really the straightforward parallels about you know the the timeliness uh, or the styles, for example, 
this uh, fragmented content sheet filmmaking uh, uh, photography that the Dietrich Ortmann does. Uh, maybe in the West, there were artists who were doing that earlier, like let's say in the 70s. But it doesn't really mean uh, that they are late. It's just that it's a very different kind of uh, environment and setting. Also because information was not easily circulated in, in the East. I mean, this is one of the questions that we really want to understand. We know universities and the libraries and universities were able to collect magazines, uh, art magazines from the West. But outside of that, if you were not part of that, it was not really easy to find that. So there is a lot of uh, experimentation that is coming, I find, from working in isolation, in a sense, uh, in, in small groups, very collaboratively, but in small groups and within the country, not uh, circulating outside. But we want to look more into that because uh, it's a very important question. Yeah, thank you for that very good question. And, and, and thank you, Isotta, for your great um, lecture. It's really eight o'clock, so it looks like oh, okay. um, we're going to, yeah, to finish our today's presentation. So I thank everybody for listening. And also I would like to remind you about our next um, online lecture, which will be very soon, actually, on February the 14th. At the same time, 7 p.m. for us in Europe or... Uh, um, 10. 10, right? 10. And, yes. Yes, 10, in, 10 a.m. On the West Coast. And our next step, yeah, homes from the University of Missouri in and after the GDR, but we'll send advertisement, but just keep it in mind on so February the 14th. And um, yes, thank you everybody for listening. Have a good evening or rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all.